Ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you very much for attending uh, uh, another one of the Society Outreach debates. I am honoured uh, to uh, chair these debates, although, uh, as you know, every time I remind people uh, that the real chairperson is Fouad, uh, uh, Fouad al Faturi, uh, rather, who is a uh, uh, tremendous worker in terms of organising events and getting all the uh, speakers and everyone here. She books the room, she does everything, and she lets me chair this event. I just don't know how she does it, but um, I'm very grateful. Um, I have to say that all uh, Swad's previous meetings on Palestine, the Middle East, uh, on the Muslim world, the, the effects of a war on women and children, and lots of other meetings have been all political, where uh, she probably has been affected, but not as much as uh, in this particular me meeting where she's affected because of what's happening in Libya. So Tunisia, Egypt and Libya, unrest, de uh, democracy, the minor in the Middle East, uh, the will of the people, whether it needs to be respected just not only in these countries, but where next? Uh, I know that there are some friends who want to talk about Bahrain, there are people who want to talk about Yemen, there are people who want to talk about Syria and maybe <coughs> even Algeria, but we want to keep our uh, topic today on Tunisia, Egypt and Libya. Uh, for me, I know that many of my British Muslim community have been very concerned because they think this is somehow some sort of another war against a Muslim state. Uh, people, I, I wasn't in favor of uh, war in uh, Iraq, I'm deeply concerned about the war in Afghanistan, but I have to tell you, I support every action that has been taken against the Libyan uh, Colonel Gaddafi. Because I, I, have, I have been to Libya, I have been to Libya, I have seen the effects of this man's, apart from the fact that when you occasionally see him, the way he gets dressed and he addresses the United Nations and he has the green book and he has his own ideas on the world and how he wants to be the king of Africa, but he doesn't give enough, uh, neither the finance, the money, the, the education, the training, the employment and, and the freedom to the people of Libya. The only five million people half the size of London which he could easily do with the billions and hundreds of billions of dollars he's wasted on the biggest man-made <coughs> projects and lots of other things that I, I'm very familiar with. But I don't want to waste time because we've got uh, five uh, top uh, experts who will speak on this, these issues. Tunisia, Egypt, Libya. Uh, of course, we don't need to repeat uh, the events of uh, Tunisia, Egypt, and, uh, you know, I know I have uh, friends here from uh, the, um, uh, the Egyptian and Tunisian background and certainly from uh, Libya. I can, I can tell you, uh, uh, Mr. Saeed is just walking in, uh, uh, in into the room and he and I, uh, Mr. Saeed is not listening, but we, I'm sorry, sir. We, uh, sorry, we, we, we went to Libya in 1999, in fact, I have the honor of raising British flag on behalf of the British government uh, in 1999 when the diplomatic relations resumed. Uh, so Robin Cook, uh, the, the great man, the foreign secretary asked me to raise the flag on behalf of the British government. So I have a little bit of experience but not as much as our uh, first speaker who is <coughs> Dr. Corina Mullen, uh, who's a lecturer in uh, uh, politics of the Middle East, Department of Politics and International Studies at SOAS. Uh, she's the expert. And with round of applause, please, uh, let's ask Dr. Mullen to make the first presentation to you. Thank you very much for a kind introduction. Um, I'm going to be focusing today uh, mostly on Tunisia, but I'll be talking about regional uh, ramifications as well as the ramifications of events in Tunisia and Egypt in particular um, for uh, Western foreign policy. 
Um, I had the great opportunity recently uh, to go to Tunisia, to visit Tunisia as part of a human rights delegation um, comprised largely of lawyers, um, uh, human rights activists, and uh, academics. <clears throat> we were investigating uh, the crimes committed during the Ben Ali regime um, and also focusing specifically on um, Western complicity um, in those crimes. Um, so I have a, perhaps a, 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 a different perspective, and I'm um, really open to um, and excited to engage um, in, in some discussion and, and I imagine that debate and, um, after the um, presentation. Um, so it was an exciting time to be in Tunisia, of course, um, not only to witness this um, incredible revolution that had taken place, but also to see um, uh, confirmed uh, what people had been saying about this being really the beginning um, of, the, of, of the, the end of the beginning, sorry, rather than the beginning of the end. That the revolution is very much an ongoing process, um, and those people who are involved in the revolution, those the civil, civil society actors, um, political opposition, um, etc., um, are very much um, still involved and, um, and worried, of course, um, that uh, there are elements, status quo elements, um, counter-revolutionary and entrenched interests that may um, hinder um, the uh, realization of the goals um, and consolidation as well of the um, gains of the revolution. Um, but that being said, and um, <coughs> I don't want to make it out to be too pessimistic an assessment. Of course, it was an incredible um, thing to witness, an incredible um, a, 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 a historical transformation that has taken place in the region. Um, and the reverberations, of course, of the Tunisian Revolution are still being felt across the region today. Um, in Egypt, of course, on February 11th, um, after weeks of mass protests, we saw the fall of another um, dictatorial regime, uh, the end of Mubarak's 30-year year rule. Um, We've also seen, of course, uh, mass uh, mobilization and rebellion across the region, including in Libya, um, which my colleagues will be talking about more depth, um, as well as elsewhere in North Africa, including Algeria, Morocco, um, Yemen, of course, um, even in, uh, uh, in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> in those countries, though, where the revolutions have been successful in their key demand of um, overthrowing the regime, um, there's no doubt, as I've said, that much remains to be done. The situation still remains fluid, with concerns being expressed by opposition leaders, activists, and human rights experts, um, th that, as I've said, the revolution's goals um, may be thwarted. Um, and they're also demanding, of course, that the transitional government consolidates the progress that has been made over the last weeks and months, um, and comply with the promises that have been made to, amongst other things, hold free and fair elections in the near future in which all members of society can participate freely, implement much needed judicial and constitutional reforms uh, to allow for the repeal of all restrictions on civil liberties, freedom of expression, organization and assembly, as well as the establishment of free trade of unions and the enforcement of respect for human rights. Um, in Tunisia, and, and, and in particular, I can say from experience, but also from what I've read about Egypt um, and in my conversations with activists um, and academics um, with expertise on, the, on that area, um, there are also um, demands being made for transitional justice, um, demands for investigations into the crimes that were committed during um, uh, the uh, uh, dictatorial regimes of Mubarak and Ben Ali, um, as well as those committed um, during the revolutionary process. Um, with demands being made that those who were responsible, found responsible for those um, crimes be brought to justice and reparations be given to victims. Um, so though many of the demands of the past and ongoing revolutions were political in nature, it's also been widely acknowledged that economic factors have played, played a large role um, with one of the key demands of the revolutions. Um, being that the structural economic factors um, uh, responsible for the unrest in the first place, many of which were often caused or exacerbated by the economic policies of Western states and international financial institutions like the IMF and World Bank, um, be addressed. These include um, soaring food prices, for example, that many people um, uh, said were, uh, thought were a result of structural adjustment policies and privatization, economic stratification, high levels of unemployment and poverty, and inadequate uh, employment opportunities. In addition to these 
uh, economic and political demands that have been made by the protesters. Another key demand has been a restoration of the people's dignity. Um, as was evident in many of the protest slogans and protesters uh, and, and, and posters, the people were calling for karama wahora, uh, this demand for dignity and freedom. Um, the demand for dignity in particular, I think, has two dimensions. Um, one, of course, is concerned with the dignity of the individual, um, which has been repeatedly violated by the dictators of the region through corruption, violence, and general oppression. And secondly, um, and this is where the West um, is concerned, um, the dignity of the, of the people, a collective dignity, um, which has been contemptuously violated not only by these dictators, but also, and perhaps more importantly for this context, by their Western supporters. How is this collective dignity violated? Every time a Western state, a Western government approves military training, cooperation, or weapon sales to a brutal dictator in full knowledge that they can be used, can and will be used against his own people, they are participating in the violation of the collective dignity of the people of the region. Each time they apply double standards in their support for certain governments and parties, and conversely, their condemnation or intervention on behalf of human rights violations of certain states while remaining silent in the face of the crimes of others, they are participating in the violation of the collective dignity of the people of the region. Each time they proclaim to support democracy in the region and then proceed to interfere with democratic processes and or ignore the will of the people when these processes produce results that are deemed to conflict with their own interest, they are participating in the violation of the collective dignity of the people of the region. There is one particular sign that stays with me from the Tunisian revolution, from the Tunisian protest, that I think summed up not only the feelings of the Tunisian people, but others in the region um, who have bravely taken to the streets in these past few months to demand change and a restoration of their dignity. It read simply and in English, which makes me think the message um, was uh, directed at um, Western governments. Um, it read simply, game over. Um, this, I think, was directed not only at the repressive kleptocratic regimes that have ruled their countries for decades, but also at the international system that has enabled them to be there. Most importantly, through the copious amounts of U.S. and European diplomatic, economic, and military aid of the U.S. that has been given in the, in the name of maintaining order and stability, spreading neoliberal economic reform, or fighting terrorism in an attempt to alleviate, uh, as, or in an attempt to alleviate pressure on the West's number one al uh, regional ally, Israel. Um, while there are so many possible perspectives, considerations, and analyses to discuss, um, I uh, will briefly comment on the impact of these incredible developments um, have had on two key areas. Their impact upon Islamist movements in the region and the way they are viewed in the West, and their impact on the Israel-Palestine and regional broader regional peace process. And I'll finish with some brief remarks on the policy direction that I think Western governments, including the US and UK, um, should be taking in light of these events. So perhaps one of the most important impacts these incredible and inspiring uprisings and revolutions we've witnessed over the past months have had is on the development of political Islam in the region, as well as the way Islamist movements are viewed and analyzed by Western academics, media, and policy makers. For decades, the West has worked side by side with authoritarian regimes in, of the region and were complicit in their use of the threat of Islamist fundamentalism to repress political opposition. And I can say, and perhaps this is something I can comment on more in the question and answers, that in my various um, interviews with former political prisoners, lawyers, judges who um, talked about even um, actual intervention by members of foreign um, diplomatic staff in, in cases um, uh, that were held uh, being brought against um, uh, 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 people charged with terrorism. Um, I, I may be able to give you some more concrete examples uh, later on. Um, but one point that I can say was raised over and over in my conversations with various civil society actors in Tunisia was how the war on terror was viewed as a major factor in the unwarranted arrest, torture, prosecution, and imprisonment of thousands of innocent Tunisians solely for their religious and or political beliefs and practices over the past decade. Um, and, and this is not to say that these governments manipulated the West, as many people have made out, but that their claims of the threat of Islamic fundamentalism, I think, fit within the West's agenda to maintain the status quo in the region, um, and one which proved amenable to their geostrategic and, and material interests, at least at the time including security, trade, migration, 
um, oil, access to other, and access to other natural resources, and protection, as I said, of um, the most important ally in the region, Israel. Um, so though there has been consistent resistance during, this, during the period of these dictatorial regimes in the region, from secular leftist, liberal, and Islamist movements, the opposition was generally crushed, with tens of thousands imprisoned, killed, and tortured. Again, in the context of the war on terror, much of this repression was excused and indeed supported by the West. That believed that these brutal rulers' common cry that the sole conceivable alternative to them was an extremist Islamist takeover. But in the aftermath of these uprisings, we have yet to see this threat materialize. Instead, when we look at what is emerging in terms of political trends amongst Islamist movements in the region, we see cooperation rather than intransigence, moderation rather than extremism. As a challenge to the typical Orientalist analyses that, we've, that have viewed Islamist movements as unchanging and static, what we have witnessed during this period of uprisings is the fact that Islamist movements can and indeed have changed dramatically. This is a trend that has been occurring over the past 10 to 15 years and can be witnessed in the transformed discourses of Islamist movements such as Hamas and Hezbollah, as well as the Muslim Brotherhood which appeal today, much more so than in the past, to universal human rights and international law. We can certainly observe that since the 20th century, far from being advocates of religious extremism, the Muslim Brotherhood, like other Islamic-oriented candidates of political parties in Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Egypt, Lebanon, etc., have opted for ballots, not bullets. Islamist activists are now entering the political scene through processes of democratization, and the fact that these movements are entering the political scene through making alliances with others, pledging to accept election results, and seeking to go beyond their constituency, proves just how far they've, 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 they've gone in terms of, of change. Um, and also, this is something else I'd like to pick up on, upon, perhaps in the question and answer, in my discussions with some of the NAFTA, which is the modern Islamist Tunisian party um, leaders that I met with in Tunisia, who talked about how their involvement with other oppositional movements in the process of the revolution, as well as in the post-revolutionary period, has really transformed um, some of their policies in the Congo. Um, as well as, I can say that from our uh, discussions with other movements who have been involved in these um, negotiations with NAFTA, including, the, for example, the Tunisian Communist Party and other civil society actors, those movements have also been transformed in their interaction with NAFTA. So that's something that's interesting and uh, we, sh uh, we should look into. Um, oh, and undoubtedly, the aftershock um, from the regional political earthquake and the shift of the balance of power it has catalyzed has been most felt in relation to the Israel-Palestine conflict. As governments of neighboring states start to more adequately reflect the will of their populations, they will no doubt prove less amenable to Israeli interests. Um, certainly, we'll see a more level playing field created um, and that should, um, I think, strengthen the Palestinian hand in, uh, in the peace process. Most, the most important player, I would say, in this respect, of course, is Egypt. Um, it's a prominent um, U.S. and Western ally. Of course, it was also the first country to sign a peace deal with Israel in 1979. Um, this deal, of course, was not signed, though, by a democratic Arab government, but was reached in spite of strong opposition that persists until today. I see I only have one minute to go, so perhaps I should hurry up and go, move on to my um, conclusions. Um, of course, uh, uh, in general, um, uh, I, I do think that transformation is already occurring. I was just going to give a couple of examples um, from the Egyptian Foreign Ministry, who have recently spoken out about um, uh, uh, opening up the Gaza Strip, for example, um, criticizing Israel's role in Operation Pass Lead in the 2008-2009 um, Israeli invasion of Gaza. Um, and um, has also uh, pledged its support to the Palestinians um, to end, um, to lift the Israeli imposed siege of Gaza. But finally, let me just conclude, if I could just have another minute, um, what, uh, where, where I think um, uh, Western states should be going. And this um, relates to, uh, as well, where I think the Israeli uh, state should be going in terms of um, its policies um, and um, response to this incredible um, transformation that we're seeing occurring um, across the region. So the Israelis have reached an important juncture, I would say, and now have two choices. Um, either they continue down the path of intransigence and aggression that will no doubt lead to greater insecurity for the Palestinians as well as the Israeli populations and to a greater risk of regional conflagrations in the future, 
or can take advantage of this opportunity to completely change course and enter into real and comprehensive peace talks with its neighbors, based on respect for international law, sovereignty of its neighbors, and the national aspirations of the Palestinian people. So I think really we have to see a transformation in um, Israeli foreign policy outlook um, away from a kind of a zero-sum uh, security framework that it's been operating under, where any gain for um, its, its perceived enemies are seen as a loss for itself. I mean, towards one um, that um, respects, as I said, um, the sovereignty and aspirations of its neighbors. In this respect, and this brings me to my final point regarding what Western states can do at this time as a means to get on the right side of history, um, <clears throat> and even for selfish reasons, as a way to promote their own interests in the region. To begin with, they can start by delinking their own interests in the region from Israel and put an end to the double standards which have far too long characterized the policies, um, uh, their policies towards the various sides of the conflict. They could also take advantage of the opportunity to implement much needed broader structural changes in their foreign policy towards the region by placing real conditions on the sale of military equipment as well as the provision of, real, of uh, economic and military aid supplied to undemocratic and repressive regimes in the region, including Israel, Jordan, Yemen, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia, in order to help facilitate the efforts of the people of these countries to similarly regain their agency and make their own history as the people of Tunisia and Egypt have done. Significant cuts and aids to these states, coupled with an overall reduction in military spending and an end to Western aggression in the region, would have the effect of killing, um, uh, so to say, two birds with one stone as it would also promote Western efforts, uh, Western government's efforts to address the economic crisis and to reduce these massive budget deficits in a more ethical manner than current proposals, which entail massive cuts to social spending. Um, furthermore, Western states could recognize how important the demand for dignity is to the people who have so bravely put their lives on the line to effect real change in their countries. This would entail a recognition of the damage that past policies have caused the people in the region. Most important, a recognition of the past military, economic, and political support the U.S. and European states have provided these brutal dictators, and which has enabled them to stay in power for as long as they have. The most common demand I heard when talking with various civil society actors that participated in the Tunisian revolution, when I asked them about what they thought the West could do to support their revolution, was uh, to stay away from it. Hands off, in other words. The people of the region are understandably cynical and wary of Western offers of support for the democratic transitions, deemed by many to be too little and too late. There is an enormous hope and dedication amongst the participants of these revolutions. They've uniformly expressed a desire to live in free, independent, and democratic states, a right that decades of Western intervention has denied them. The least the West can do now is respect the people of the region and the demand for real sovereignty and equality amongst other peoples and nations of the world. Master William, thank you so much. Uh, your uh, uh, presentation was so good that I didn't want to interrupt, even though it went over time. Your recommendations were fantastic. And of course, your observations, and in particular, you know, when you talked about uh, what, almost everything what you said is very important, but um, how these dictators have used war on terror for their own purposes against their opponents. And more recently, we've seen the Egyptian leaders saying, well, Muslim Brotherhood can take over. This would be very dangerous for, uh, for Israel, but more importantly for the rest of the Middle East. And Mr. Qaddafi came out and said, it's Al-Qaeda that's walked into this country, and it's Al-Qaeda that is uh, uh, taking over uh, the, the, this, uh, his country. So um, thank you for, for, for that, and I'm sure people will want to ask you questions later on. Uh, our second speaker is Nahid Abu Zaid, Senior Broadcaster Journalist at the BBC World Service. He's still in the queue. So, and I know that Dr. Azam Anthony, okay. All right. Shamim. Shamim Chaudhry. Okay, well, our next speaker then, I'm so sorry. Our next speaker is uh, Shamim Chaudhry, who works at Al Jazeera. She wants to point out that she's not representing Al, Al Jazeera here. She will speak as 
Shamim Chaudhary with an expertise uh, and background of being a journalist. She's written for many uh, British newspapers including the Daily Telegraph, the Daily Express, Daily Mail, lots more. She has an ex a, a, a experience and expertise at Al Jazeera uh, as the uh, deputy news editor and it's my pleasure to hand over the uh, microphone to you. Thank you, Lord Ahmed, for the very kind introduction, and thank you, Mr. Ward, for inviting me here this evening. It's an honour and a privilege to be taking part in this discussion. And as Lord Ahmed said, I do have to stress that I am here in a private capacity. Um, I'm not formally representing Al Jazeera, and any views um, that I um, share with you are my own views and not that of Al Jazeera, because I would like to have a job. And also, I have to apologise to Lord, Lord Ahmed in advance before I start uh, going through my prepared notes, because you specifically said that we can't talk about any countries other than Tunisia, Egypt, and oh. Libya, but I'm afraid I do talk to them, so oh. it's too late. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, what we've been witnessing in the Middle East over the past few months um, has been truly historic and unprecedented. Um, there's not been any kind of uprising um, of this magnitude by people spanning almost an entire continent um, for generations. The Arabs of North Africa, the Gulf and the Middle East um, and, and other parts of the Middle East are demanding freedom, they want democracy, they want liberation from oppression, but they want practical things, they want jobs, they want an end to poverty, they want an end to injustice and they want an end to government corruption. The very simple things that everybody should have a right to. That's all they're asking for, nothing more. Since the beginning of this year, we've seen revolutions in Tunisia and in Egypt, and we've seen large-scale Western military intervention in Libya after Gaddafi's forces turned on, its, on civilians who were calling, simply calling for the things that I've just listed and calling for an end to his regime. In addition to these countries, protests have taken place on the streets of Bahrain, Syria, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Morocco. These events have given rise to many geopolitical questions, many of which my uh, esteemed colleague here, Dr. Mullen, has touched on. Um, but I just want to focus on one specific aspect, and it's in the title of tonight's uh, discussion. So the title of this evening's discuss discussion is Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya Unrest, a Democracy Domino in the Middle East. And the key words that stood out to me were democracy domino. And this is what I've decided to talk about. This is what I'm going to be focused on. Um, and of course, the phrase Arab Spring has been being brandished about for uh, some time now. So this is why I'm going to try and examine what does this democracy do domino mean? And is this what is happening in the Middle East now? So a domino effect is a chain reaction that occurs when a small change causes a similar change nearby, which will then cause another change, and so on and so forth, like dominoes. Um, so with this definition in mind, is what's happening in the Middle East a domino effect? Well, if we're referring just to the protests themselves, without for one minute thinking about the end result, then yes, it would seem so. The Tunisian protests were followed by the Egyptian protests, which were in turn followed by demonstrations in Libya and elsewhere. So clearly there was a chain of events. But are these protests the beginning of a democracy domino, the key word being democracy here? In other words, will these regimes fall seamlessly and systematically, and will in their place emerge democratic states as we understand them? That is the big question, and that is what the whole world is looking and waiting to see. Well, if there is a chain reaction, it has so far been a very short chain. Tunisia was followed by Egypt, and then the chain broke. There's been no revolution so far in Libya in the same way. Gaddafi was, was, uh, responded with such brutal force that it resulted in the passing of UN resolution, Security Council Resolution 1973, and, uh, no fly, as we all know, a no-fly zone was imposed, and a Western-led military assault in the form of Operation Odyssey Dawn is taking place, taken over yesterday by NATO. Um, and regime change is its end goal, even though they may not necessarily come out and say that we all know that that is the end goal. Um, what is happening on, in Libya could go on for a very long time, um, it's been said, and it may well end up with a divided Libya. So it's complex, it's going to be long-winded, it hasn't been as relatively straightforward as Tunisia and Egypt. 
So the domino effect doesn't look like it's happening as far as Libya is concerned. It stopped before it's barely started. But of course, with recent events in Yemen, it does look like the Yemen is about to um, follow suit um, in the same lines as Tunisia and Egypt. The protests, which have included clashes between Islamic, Islamist fighters and government troops, have resulted in President Ali Abdullah Saleh announcing that after three decades in power, he will be stepping down this year. He has invited opposition leaders to talks, but the protests are ongoing, and the masses are saying that they want him to leave right now. So certainly, Yemen does appear to be part of this downfall dominance. <coughs> um, as for the other protests in other countries, yes, there's been violence, uh, and yes, they are continuous in spread and, and spreading, most recently seen in Syria, but they've not yet had been, yet, and I stress yet, we don't really know what's going to happen, but so far they've not really been on the same scale as Egypt, as Tunisia, and as we're seeing in Yemen. Perhaps Syria is getting there, but it's still slightly early days, I think. Um, so, um, whether, whether they will end up in the same way that Tunisia and Egypt has, uh, we don't know. These, these protests are taking place, but they may not necessarily lead to the overthrow of existing regimes. Another thing we have to bear in mind is that these countries have very specific characteristics, and when we're thinking about the domino effect, we can't necessarily compare them to Tunisia and Egypt. In fact, the entire Middle East, this is, I, I think this is an important point, the entire Middle East is not a homogenous region, which would perhaps, one would argue, you would need in order for a domino effect to take place. For example, Tunisia and Egypt are relatively homogenous societies, so in both countries, the vast majority of the people sought to cooperate united, they have built a united front, and they sought to cooperate in unison against the authoritarian regime. You don't see that in other Arab countries. In countries like Yemen, Jordan, Syria, the authoritarian regime, regime are reasonably successful in dividing the opposition. And the, the result of that is you've got different factions having different ideas and fighting each other, and that weakens any opposition and it gives strength to the authoritarian regime because they can play off the different groups and, and as a result, keep their positions. So that's something that needs to be borne in mind. Um, also, a number of regimes where protests are taking place have offered reforms to some degree or another. Al Jazeera, has, uh, Al Jazeera, Algeria even, <laughs> has lifted its state of emergency, which has been in place since 1992. Syria has promised to do the same, and it's released political prisoners. And if we turn to Jordan, King Abdullah dismissed his government and ordered in a new prime minister, Marouf Bakit, to carry out political reforms when protests in his country broke out. But in Jordan, the uh, Islamic movement, the Islamic Action Front, said, has said it's not seeking to oust King Abdullah, and this is a significant point, but it just, it's just not happy with the new Prime Minister who's been appointed and now wants him removed. So there are different objectives here if you look at various uh, countries in the Middle East. It's also worth bearing in mind that Jordan is run by a royal family and substantial sections of the Jordanian population are fiercely loyal to the monarchy, so it's not the entire population of Jordan wanting to get rid of the monarchy, and that's, I think there would be uh, some uh, huge differences of opinions there. And this is all the, also the case in Morocco, which is, again, is, is the monarchy, and it, the monarchy has a lot of loyal supporters. Morocco also has a bit more freedom than other um, uh, Arab countries, and that's probably one of the reasons why it's been able to contain its protests so far. Then there's Bahrain. Here also, the events are of a very specific nature, and don't necessarily conform, and these, you know, well, these are just ideas that I'm just putting out there, and uh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sure people may not necessarily agree with this, but it can be argued that the, the specific nature of what's happening in Bahrain does not conform to the criteria needed for a domino effect. The demonstrations here are sectarian in nature, and the weeks of protest by the sheer majority population against the ruling Sunni establishment have been described as a war by proxy between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And this is especially given that over a thousand troops have been brought into Bahrain at the request of the Bahrain authorities uh, from Saudi Arabia to help quell the protests. And then 
the, and I, and on the subject of Saudi Arabia, I do want to mention that you know there have been some protests there as well, um, on a slightly smaller scale. But the chances are they probably won't escalate simply because uh, the people in Saudi Arabia don't suffer quite the same levels of uh, poverty as perhaps they do in other Middle Eastern countries um, and elsewhere in the Arab world. So given all these specific characteristics, characteristics, characteristics that I've just pointed out, will these countries go in the same way as Tunisia or Egypt? Or, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a number of uh, uh, things that can happen. Will the protests protest simply ebb away, just peter out into nothing? Will the protesters agree to the concessions offered by the regimes? Will they be quelled by brute force, which we know is not unknown in that part of the world? Or will the protesters keep going until the regimes do eventually stand down, as we've seen in Tunisia and Egypt? It's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to predict how we see things going. Can I keep going? Um, what has happened in Libya has given many Arabs something, something to think about. They want to know how far they can push this. One thing is for sure, they certainly don't want to end up living in a country on the brink of the civil war, being fired at by foreign missiles. I think we can safely come to that conclusion. So for, for now at least, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Oman, the UAE, Algeria, and even Syria don't seem to be dominoes about to fall. But the key, fra the, key, the key phrase in the sentence that, uh, uh, that is the title of this discussion is democracy domino. So even if some or all or a few of these regimes do fall, will they be replaced by democracy as we know and understand it? Can we expect to see free and fair elections soon afterwards which lead to a smooth transition of a multi-party system or is there going to be some kind of a power vacuum that leads to chaos in these regions? Or will one regime simply be removed only, by, only to be replaced by something similar? The recent events in the Middle East have been compared to Europe in 1989, the domino effect and the collapse of communism. But is this really an accurate comparison? For a start, unlike the former communist bloc countries, there's no history of democracy in the Middle East. Instead, there's poverty, corruption and unemployment. There's also the question of religion. Many in the, religion, many in the region believe that a system of government based on Islamic guidelines is incompatible with the notion of Western-led democracy. So it's a bit simplistic to assume that if and when these autocratic regimes fall, they will be replaced by democracy as we know it. And these are just two of the many, many examples of how the Middle East today differs from the communist bloc of 1989. With this in my mind, can we really expect a democracy domino? If we look at Tunisia, the people of Tunisia succeeded in getting rid of President Zil Abdin Ben Ali. It was a genuine uprising with mass support across the country. But if we look at Tunisia now, democratic opposition is going about trying to work out how to win elections. The military is obsessed with stability, and the newly legalized Islamists have seen a gap and are now trying to claim their stake. In Eastern Europe, there seemed only one alternative to the communist dictatorship, and that was democracy. In the Middle East, there are many ideologies that will be, vi will be now vying for a, a place in the spotlight. It therefore appears that even in these countries where long-standing long starting, long starting regimes do end as a, end as a result of this protest. The main push is going to be for a more open society, an end to dictatorship, better living standards and jobs, rather than specifically a democracy in the sense that we understand it. So at this moment, we don't really know what's going on and how it's going to pan out. This is, a, as we call in the world of news, a massive moving story. You know, it's breaking news practically every day. Something new is happening. <coughs> And the political landscape in the Middle East is happening so rapidly that we don't know which regime is going to be the next to fall. We don't know what the next change is going to be. But whatever happens, it seems to describe it as a democracy domino is, in my view, a little bit simplistic and slightly inaccurate. Thank you, Thank you very much for uh, that analysis, and that's why... When, when I was sort of looking at this type of democracy domino, uh, and the democracy domino um, 
even though even Libya uh, pray, uh, even though we may not, I think what um, uh, Shamim was saying was that we may not get the democracy as we know it, the Westminster style of democracy or the European style of democracy or Western style of democracy, at least what you have is the current regimes moving towards giving more rights, opening up dialogue, lifting uh, the, um, the uh, state of emergency, uh, engaging with their opposition, and let's hope that we will have that democracy domino effect at some stage. But anyway, let's uh, uh, move on to our... Tell about Libyan women how she is suffering under the dictatorship. Thousands of people they kill in Libya. More than 1,800 just kidnapped in Sidi Zawiya. Like kill the children, women. So this is how women suffering in Libya. It's not only just now. For 42 years, women we are suffering under the dictatorship. We have been unhappy. She can tell us about her experience in Libya and what happened to Iman Lafiti. You hear about it. The women she said, This is Iman, is one of 100 of women. So she can give her, excuse me, my for five minutes. Okay, is it on? Yes. Um, okay, as my um, sister Swan introduced me, my name is Amal Abedi. Originally, I'm from Libya, but I'm a citizen. Um, um, my previous job and um, university lecturer in international law and human rights before I became asylum in the UK. Um, basically, um, the issue of the violation of human rights has been permanent in Libya since Gaddafi came to the power in a comedian revolution in 1969. And in 1976, the dictatorship phase has clearly discovered to Libyan people when Gaddafi started killing civilians in the street and others being kept in prison and later being killed. The university's students and academics, I'm telling you from my experience what I have witnessed back home. And the university's students and academics are being executed in public places and the front of us and I was witness to numbers of um, execution uh, that was going on in Libya on the 7th of April of each year. Um, basically, um, um, their bodies which is being left in the streets for a few days to be a strong lesson to others who may think about standing against Gaddafi. The first woman who was ever accused in Libya because of her political opinion, it was in the Gaddafi's regime. I cannot mention for her name, but she kept in prison for more than 15 years. And women who were a student at Garunas University where I finished my studies in Benghazi, the second study in Libya, were also arrested and kept in prison in 1980s. However, some of them been released and others still kept in silent place and we do not know what has been happened to them um, until now. Similar case was reported to the Amnesty International in January 2003. The university lecturer who was arrested, raped, and tortured by more than 20 security officers fled her home country, Libya, and sought asylum in the UK. After the investigation into her case by the Amnesty International, Libyan authorities, um, sadly, as usual, has savagely denied that could ever happen to Libya. In this case, she is now a British citizen living in London with a professional job, but the pain that was caused into her body and her soul is still knocking on her mind. As we all know that from the psychological perspective that such a pain never goes away. And um, you can ask me or ask me, ask me about this kind of pain. Um, you suffer in silence and you torture in silence as well and how hard and even tough for a young woman to lose her virginity in this way. But the that is and his security been implementing this kind of abuse years and years ago. This man who made us live in a big lies called the Green Book, his corrupted thought that destroyed Libyan people and made us live even below the poverty line in the most rich country in the world. Gaddafi, the man who stole from us our childhood <coughs> and our first smile since we were born, all what we've been taught in the schools, 
his only bloody green book and sing it with his name. He made us psychologically suffer until this age. Among the European people whom my childhood being covered with the blood, execution, killing, and etc. And still remember the bodies of the Universities Academy who be executed and left on the streets to be watched by the public for a few days. Ladies and gentlemen, we may need a hundred thousand of paper to document what it's been happening in Libya to men and to women, to children and to elderly, from the world's away from the world's eye and how much we've been abused and suffered in silence without getting any support from the outside Libya. The information that recently been obtained by a new rights group organization has been hugely appreciated, but the truth has not been uh, told yet. Our main issue today, not only the situation in Libya, but it's the case of Iman al abidi my cousin, who she is coming from the same child that I come from, her first crime of her ever crime that she is not just from Benghazi or from the east of Libya, but she is relatively she is um, um, belong to Mr. Um, Abdel Fattah Yunus, um, the military officer, um, the one who resigned from the Gaddafi's regime, and the first military um, um, officer who supported the rebels since um, 17 February on this year. Um, Amanda Rebeli, she is one of the thousand women who have been banished to a world that we do not hear about it. A man who is a postgraduate student in law in Germany, she is as well held a degree in law. She was arrested at the checkpoint in one of, the, uh, of Tripoli's street. Ironically, and as usual, the Libyan government says a woman who stormed into a Tripoli hotel on Saturday to tell foreign reporters that government troops raped her is now with her family. We all know this is not true. According to the dramatic images that have been shown on TV's station, Iman al the heartbroken who was tearful as she told how Gaddafi's troop psychologically and physically and sexually abused her, she was taken away from the world and known place. Musa Ibrahim, the son of Musa Kosa, the well-known criminal in, world, in the world and one of Gaddafi's supporters, <coughs> Musa Ibrahim, who suddenly became from interpreter to a government spokesman, stated that the woman was a prostitute who refused to accept medical examination and that she is now with her sister in Libya, the capital. According to, the, to this, according to his false information, I can strongly, I can confirm that Iman is not a prostitute. Iman, she comes from a very well-known conservative family and the tribe. She is a postgraduate young woman who was born in 1982. I believe that the government has made this fake statement to force her and her family to change their statement to the outside world. There is something I must stress here to everybody that um, the prostitution is not an easy case, it's not an easy issue in Libya. And if any family find out that one of their daughters being a prostitute, then the owner cannot will take place straight away. I therefore warn Libyan spokesman, Mr. Musa Ibrahim, of this fake statement and not to play with women's owner and to protect his dictator regime. Hence, from this painful moment, we are begging and asking all the human rights organization and the Prime Minister of this country, alongside the West, to put pressure in Gaddafi security to release Iman without any condition and to tell the truth to the world. However, I strongly doubt that Gaddafi will ever tell the truth to the world. Thank you very much. very much for that. Um, we've all seen that horrible, horrible footage of when a man was uh, beaten up um, and abused right in front of uh, the cameras. I was watching the uh, footage again on Sky TV this morning. They've been showing it quite a lot. And I think that all of us can um, actually demand that um, Already, the Secretary General <coughs> of the United Nations has already said, and so has our Prime Minister, that people should be warned that cases in the International Criminal Court will be brought against these people 
and Musa Ibrahim should not be excluded in that, that he's complicit in the, uh, the uh, abuse that uh, uh, this lady has faced. So I, I'm quite happy if you want, you can write from Society Outreach a letter to the, uh, to the prosecutor at the ICC and already make the case and maybe in future that's the least that we can do. Um, our next speaker, thank you very much for that, our next speaker is probably the most expert in the air warfare that we will have. Um, Professor Tony Marshall, Air Vice Marshall, who has huge experience uh, as well as being an academic at the um, Birmingham University. He has uh, uh, been teaching at the um, RAF, US uh, Air Force, Australia, New Zealand, German, Swedish, Netherlands. The list goes on where uh, he has taught. But I think one of the um, uh, uh, most important jobs he's held was that he's advisor, uh, he was advisor to the House of Commons Defence Committee. And, <coughs> excuse me. And he has contributed uh, chapters of uh, uh, expertise in various books on the um, uh, air warfare and uh, also the importance, not only in the Kosovo uh, 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 history of air warfare, but also uh, in uh, various other parts of the world. So um, I think it's very important for us today to understand the action that has been taken in Libya and whether it is the goals of the United Nations and also NATO can be achieved by the NATO Air Force uh, or uh, is there anything that the governments need to be doing. So it's my pleasure to ask Air Vice Marshal Professor Tony Marshall to address you. Thank you very much for that. Western military intervention in the Middle East, again. I would just like to preface my comments by repeating almost word for word Lord Army's home opening statements. Before, during and up to the end, I publicly and strenuously opposed intervention in Iraq. I supported previously the intervention to throw out the Iraqis from Kuwait and I supported in its initial stages the objective of trying to prevent Al-Qaeda having a training grounds in Afghanistan. But that, that is my background and my comments. Um, because I very strongly support air intervention, with current um, Western intervention. What I'd like to do very briefly, as time is running, I'd like just to reflect on what is happening and very cautiously speculate on what might happen and try and put a military operation into the strategic and political context which two of our three previous speakers have, have done. Um, we're all familiar with the United Nations Security Resolution of 1973, but I would just like to emphasize two things. First, it authorized a no-fly zone but also it authorised the use of force to protect the civilian population and it also flatly forbade any ground force occupation. And it's that last point which to me is the most important one. Because one of the reasons why we had enormous, quite apart from any political misjudgments, why we had military problems and strategic problems in both Iraq and Afghanistan that we were concentrating very heavily on the ground forces which once they're in the middle of the year. Um, I, well, I'll cut short. I was going to explain the sort of facilities that are required to impose and enforce the no-fly zone. Sufficient to say that the, whether we call them NATO air forces, I prefer to use the word coalition air forces because by no means are all NATO nations going to be involved. The coalition air forces have Establish complete command and control of the air. <coughs> that means that if they wish, they are free to take action against ground targets. 
and it's that second part which has obviously caused a certain amount of political uncertainty. What we have seen is that the primary objective of Western air intervention has been to say thousands of lives already in Benghazi, and if one listens to that exceptionally powerful intervention from our, our Libyan friend on our left, um, if we had anywhere the ability to intervene and stop that, or try and stop it, and we didn't do it, what would the world then think of us? So, it's in that context that I want to go ahead from there. Okay. The, what, what has happened already? Obviously, Benghazi was saved, the other towns in eastern Libya have been relieved of pressure. But it's the less tangible things which I believe are important. We have seen the destruction of the armoured vehicles, tanks, the artillery, the armoured personnel carriers, which in addition to difference in training and experience, were the most obvious difference in the firepower between the rebels and the Gaddafi's armed forces. Now the actual destruction of those armoured vehicles, and the heavy armour, which is my jargon for all that offer together, the actual destruction of that heavy armour is comparatively light. Probably 10, 15, 20, maybe as many as 50 vehicles. But it's been very, very noticeable that very few of them in this last 48 hours have been hit with the crews in them. The vehicles have been abandoned. And the ideas I want to put forward in sequence is that if, as I believe, Gaddafi's power rests on his armed forces and specifically on his ground forces, then it's not so much a question of destroying all those ground forces. It's reducing their morale, it's reducing their efforts, and quite simply, it's to get the swing and run away from the tanks. Now, if we go slightly further forward, and we look, there's a very, very uh, topical question being asked today. Are we providing air cover now? Have we taken sides with the rebels? What happens if rebel civilians get to Tripoli and civilians supporting Gaddafi face them? Then what? Well, I have two, two parts of my answer to that. I draw a deep breath because whenever you start with any kind of military force, you never know where it's going to finish. And I can't see that. Nor can military force itself, short of massacre and annihilation, ever impose a, a solution. But my own thoughts are that we tend to forget that at the outset of the rebellion, Tripoli was also a scene of unrest and opposition to Gaddafi. He could suppress it brutally, and he did, in Tripoli, which he couldn't do in Benghazi. So there is an unknown potential element in there. The second point is related to the point I made a moment ago. If he is dependent on his armed force, and if those armed forces realize that the military odds outside Tripoli are stacked against them, then you have, again, a weakening of his power base. And the third thing, I hope it doesn't come to this, <coughs> one of the reasons why three air forces alone started this no-fly zone and imposed it, is that those three, French, British and American, have the largest, largest stocks of very, very precise weapons. Now, any airman who tells you that his precision weapon will hit the tank every time has never owned a computer. Everybody in this room will own a computer. How many times has your computer failed in the last six months or developed a huge? Guided weapons are exactly the same. So far, the absence of casualty reports, of credible casualty reports, up to and including this morning's Guardian, if you saw that, the absence of credible civilian casualty reports suggests that attacks have been very precise. We have not only begun to destroy some of the armor that destroyed the morale, we've also reduced Gaddafi's ability to command and control things. So, my cautious optimism is that slowly but surely the morale 
of the armed forces will disintegrate. But if rebel forces do get to the boundary and outskirts of Tripoli, the civilians in Tripoli will realize they're not in fact being faced by Al Jazeera. They're being faced by the Liberian brothers. And that, to me, would create an entirely different situation. But, but, as a military man, I've got to say, okay, what if? If, however unlikely, we do have a confrontation between <coughs> civilians who are supporting Gaddafi and civilians who are supporting the rebels, then I believe that at that point, NATO or whoever is commanding the air forces say, in my language, abort, return to base. At that point, I believe air power must be stopped and other diplomatic pressures must seek to resolve the civil war. Otherwise, the fears of those who feel that we will get stuck in may just prove true. My final observation, I said right at the start that I was confident and more confident in supporting this operation. And forgive me, I've got to put my light blue uniform back on for a moment rather than just a military man. The one big advantage that air power brings to a conflict is you can quite literally turn it on and off in 30 seconds. In Iraq, we had in Bosnia, not in Kosovo, but in Bosnia, in Iraq and Afghanistan, any negotiation for peace, any attempt to bring two sides together are obscured by the presence of ground forces. You have a problem of extraction, you have a problem of changing the military circumstances. And you're using air power as we're doing here, precisely as being is conceivably done in warfare, you have the opportunity to stop it literally in 30 seconds. Literally in 30 seconds. You do not have to go on and on and on and say, well, I have a ceasefire then, then, then. Oh, no. So, in sum, thank you, Well, I don't my final comment. We are in what Clausewitz called the province of uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen. But I do genuinely believe that on this occasion, supported by international law, at the plea of, I suspect, the majority of Libyan civilians, supported by regional, however ambivalent, regional countries, then I think the United Nations and Britain have taken the right step. And I'm cautiously optimistic in their back to come militarily to enhance the political situation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Marshall, thank you very much for that. Our uh, expert. Okay, well, give him a few minutes. Uh, let him walk in. Uh, please walk in. Uh, take a, a few minutes. I tell you why, because uh, I know that uh, Professor Marshall will be meeting by 8 o'clock. So we will take some questions now until uh, Dr. Zamzi Tamimi takes uh, a, a breath uh, and takes some rest before we uh, get him to speak. So uh, if there's some questions to the professor, uh, the gentleman at the back, and then I'll take, can I take three together? Sir. Thank you very much. Hi, Dr. Shabot from Media for Human Rights. I just would like to comment on uh, Professor Marshall, the idea that uh, if People from the east come to the west of uh, the country, especially Tripoli, that there will be civilians fighting civilians. The fact of the matter is, people in Tripoli almost wholeheartedly are with the uprising and with the freedom fighters, and I object 100% to the term rebels. Rebels give Gaddafi the legitimacy, and that these freedom fighters are actually illegitimate. I, I, I urge everybody, please to try to change, change the language. Uh, people in Tripoli are being suppressed, being um, subjected to extreme forms of oppression, and that is the reason why you don't see them in the street, because they did go out in the first couple of weeks, they did face bullets uh, with their, with their uh, chests, and so for that reason, we do not expect that there will be civilians fighting civilians if it comes to that uh, uh, matter. So there will only be people uh, fighting with 
the freedom fighters against the Gaddafi regime. We are Libyans, 100% uh, sure of that. What we need from the international community, what we need from Britain, is to arm the freedom fighters in order to have a fair fight. Thank you very Thank much. You Thank you very much for that comment. Sir, can you be brief rather than the long speeches? Then? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, my comment, uh, my name is William Spring. I'm the director of the group which is called Kena UK. So we actually started off with the name Christians Against NATO Aggression 11 years ago when the RAF and the Luftwaffe and the US Air Force combined together to bomb uh, a long-standing ally of Great Britain, the Serbs in Belgrade. But we'll leave that out. That was in fact the template for all NATO aggression that has gone on since. Many Muslims were taken in by the apparent use by the Americans of the Muslim argument, oh, we are liberating the Muslims in Kosovo. The Americans do not liberate anywhere. Their only concern is strategic gain. Can you be brief? Right. And my po point is this. How do you think, over as Marshall, you are going to get the support of the British people for another war in our, in a, on an Arab state? Thank How you. do you think you'll Thank get you that sir. support? Thank you, sir. Uh, I think that gentleman at the back who was <coughs> putting out... Um, yeah, okay. I'll take you. Could you ask a question rather than speaking about democracy? Ask a question, because we are taking questions rather than... Ah, question, yeah. It's just, uh, just the comment is really about... The, I think you don't understand the Arab people or the Middle East. USA and the West have never wanted democracy in the Middle East, and that's why they created the autocratic regime you were talking about. And when you say the kind, <coughs> what is the kind of democracy as we know it? Which type? Is that the American democracy, which is plutocracy? A set of billionaires compete with other set of billionaires to take power and control the world <coughs> and the workers. In the Middle East, there is <coughs> going to be a popular democracy. Probably it's not going to be imaged by the Western democracies. Because our experience, and I guess yours, in the Western democracies, it's a failure. <clears throat> every four years you go and, and vote, and then everything is done by the elites. And yesterday we saw what happened in London for people who are fighting for their food. In the Middle East, we have the autocratic powers brought in by the West in order to control the Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And sorry, I, I, just one second. Well, so what I'm saying, in Egypt and Tunisia and any other part of the world, in the Middle East, in order for this revolution to win, they have to have true democracy and to get rid of the new neoliberal democracies which is controlling the world with financial Thank you capitalism. Very much for that. Uh, uh, Thank, thank, thank you. Of, of course, uh, uh, Professor Marshall is going to respond to that. And I think uh, one question also to Shamim Chaudhry as well. Uh, was he pretty Chaudhry? I think it was. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> May I first of all apologize for the first question, if I gave offense by using the word rebel. I can assure you that that was in no way intended. Uh, that is purely and simply the academic who is accustomed to looking at governments on the one hand and those who oppose them from whatever motive in my misguided obviously opinion a rebel does not have that connotation but I, I say I apologise for giving offence to that As far as the second gentleman is concerned I'll leave it to the British people I'm not speaking of the British people I'll leave it to the British people to see how far they are swayed by that kind of statement and how far they would wish to pass by on the other side or do something about it What about the Saudis? Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We're not going to have this uh, discussion. I think uh, you, you, you saw the vote uh, in, in Parliament. Uh, these are elected people who voted. I think there are only 13 or 15 people. That who was voted. after the war began. Uh, what, sir, what about the war of progress? Sir, I'm chairing the meeting. If you let me chair it. Thank you very much. Shami. Um, uh, the gentleman was um, saying that, uh, was pointing out flaws in Western style democracies, and I entirely agree that there are many flaws in Western style democracies, and it would be arrogant of the West to 
suggest and to impose a Western form of democracy to replace the autocratic regimes that the West itself has put in place. So I do agree with you. I don't think at any stage in the statement that I made, I... Uh, I certainly didn't intend to come across as a, an advocate as, of a Western form as de of democracy um, in favour of any other form of democracy. That certainly wasn't my intention, and if that's how it came across, then uh, uh, I apologise, and, and it wasn't intentional. I think what I was trying to point out was that this domino effect has been compared to what happened in Eastern Europe in the late 1980s, uh, uh, in 1989, and the point that I was trying to make is that it's a too simplistic a comparison. Uh, we can't compare what is happening in the Middle East with what happened in, in uh, communist Europe uh, back in the late 80s for the reasons that I stated out, the, like I stated, so I, was, I certainly wasn't um, advocating a, form of, a Western form of democracy in the Middle East. Uh, and Shamim, you don't need to apologize because I've been in meetings with the uh, ruler of uh, Qatar who said we have Islamic uh, democracy and Qaddafi has talked about Islamic democracy in this country. So I mean, you know, they have their own interpretation of democracy. But as, we know it, as we know it, uh, and a democracy where people do not have any say or people are abused like we see the television uh, 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 footage. Uh, then obviously you you, uh, you look. We're, we're not going to waste time on that. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, this domino, demano, whatever it is, is uh, I think it's it's moving. So now we're going to say thank you to Professor Marshall as he is leaving uh, for coming here. And, uh, I'm going to ask uh, my very good friend. Uh, uh, Dr. Azam Tamimi, who is, uh, now he has a, a very long CV, uh, but I've known him for many years as the director of the London based Institute of Islamic Political Thought, WIPT. Uh, he has been lecturing in Japan, and I confess I do not uh, pronounce Japanese universities' names well, so a number of universities, if you like, he has. He's the author of a number of books. Uh, he, uh, he he's a regular uh, commentator on uh, Arab news uh, channels, BBC. Uh, in in this place, uh, he's speaker on the Middle East, specialist on the Palestinian, uh, Israeli, but more importantly, the Middle East issues. Sir, welcome. Sorry that you've been delayed at the. Uh, uh, some of us do get stopped occasionally at the uh, uh, entrance, uh, but I think it's because the long queues have delayed you. Very sorry about that. The floor is yours. Well, it seems increasingly that toppling an Arab dictatorship is easier than, get, than getting into parliament. <laughs> <laughs> That's good news anyway. Uh, well, let me start with uh, the Western style democracy. I think the masses who rose in Indonesia masses who rose in Egypt afterwards, they have in mind something like Western democracy. So let's not fool ourselves, because from Cairo, from Tunisia, from Riyadh, from Jeddah, from Benghazi, from Tripoli, from all these towns that have uh, been subdued by the yoke of despotism and corruption for so many years, Western liberal democracy looks quite uh, appealing. It has its flaws, but this is not the issue at the moment. Let us first get rid of dictatorship. And that's why the Arab mass is always in the first place. Now, uh, people in the Arab world, and I've been touring the region uh, recently, um, enjoy talking about why it started, how it started, and why now. And uh, you can spend hours talking about this, but it is not true that it was only sparked at the beginning of the year. Uh, there, there has been a struggle, a struggle that has continued for decades in all these countries. Uh, people have been imprisoned, have been hanged, have been tortured, uh, families suffered, <coughs> the number of widows and orphans in the thousands, not even in the hundreds, probably even more, in all of these countries. Uh, the, the Arab prisons across the region, from the ocean to the Gulf, were filled more by political activists and uh, people who were struggling to uh, speak their mind than by criminals, murderers, thugs or thieves. 
actually the real thugs and thieves and murderers were the ones who were in presidential <coughs> and royal palaces, uh, ruling the nations in whatever legitimacy they claimed to have. But above all, the Arab masses felt they were being dehumanized beyond uh, toleration. That they couldn't take it anymore. Muhammad Wa'aziz is setting fire to himself uh, is a, 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 a symbolic gesture. A man who had a university degree, who couldn't find a job, despite all the propaganda that the Bin Ali regime had put uh, on the international uh, uh, arena, he had to sell vegetables, still he couldn't sell his vegetables and eventually ended up being uh, slapped on the face by a woman employee of the government, uh, of the provincial government where he lived. So it's the sense of humiliation. The Palestinian issue has always been a reminder uh, to the Arab masses across the region, because Palestine is very important for everybody in the Arab region, uh, that, the, that these governments have been a total failure. Uh, we had all the oil in the world, we had the masses, we had the brains, the mines, we had the water, we had the resources, we had the geography, we had a history behind us, yet a few million Israeli invaders of our country could subdue the 100 plus million or probably 200 plus million Arabs. So that was another source of humiliation. So when Hezbollah won against Israel in 2006 and then when Hamas withstood the war and uh, defeated the Israeli invasion in 2008-2009, that again reminded the Arab masses that something could be done about these regimes that were only, only causing uh, so much shame and humiliation to the Arab masses. Now we have uh, two revolutions uh, past the threshold, Tunisia and Egypt. Uh, we have one that has turned into uh, resistance and armed resistance in Libya. We have one in Yemen that is uh, self-restraining, trying to avoid being turned into another armed resistance against the regime, and we have one that is burgeoning in Syria. And probably we will have more, oh, we mustn't forget Bahrain of course, Bahrain is another important place where uh, the revolution and the demands for civil rights and human rights has been subdued by the, pro the provocation of sectarianism. Then there are areas where there is a lot of fire under the cells. Do you want me to stop? No, 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 no,
Yes, it has no future. It definitely has no future. Even if this uh, struggle uh, were to take uh, longer than we wish it uh, to take, because the longer it takes, the more uh, there will be uh, suffering uh, among the civilians, among the entire population. But nevertheless, everybody agrees that the Gaddafi regime lost its legitimacy in the, the international arena. Uh, the Libyan people would never want it to remain after what they've uh, gone through, not just before, uh, in the, the, during the decades of dictatorship, but also during the wars of the atrocities committed uh, more uh, recently. Can I just stop you for one minute? Okay. Uh, and I apologize for that, because um, I have to go and vote, and so I, and, uh, so I will uh, continue chairing the meeting, and when you finish after five or six minutes, then she will open up. The I can uh, I can happily wrap up and then we we'll open it to the auction. Yeah, 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 I will sit here until. No, 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 no. Because we, the, 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 see, there is really nothing much to say about Libya apart from the fact that it, it is a question of uh, a struggle and it has to continue to the end. Uh, there is no way, no, no way it can stop. I mean, the, the threat of splitting Libya uh, that some people spoke about earlier uh, was uh, at the time a serious. Uh, uh, a threat. I hope that this can never happen. Uh, Libya must remain intact, must remain uh, one uh, country. And uh, I hope that uh, the uh, revolutionaries can uh, gain the momentum to, uh, uh, to finish the job. Although, I, as I said earlier, I would have loved personally, as many other people, uh, to have seen this uh, continue uh, by a more peaceful means, but Gaddafi didn't leave them uh, a room for this. A little bit about Syria, and we must just say something about Syria. Has any, any of the speakers said anything about Syria? No, I think what's going on. The next conference. Uh, next conference. No, but, since, Syria, <laughs> but since Syria is now a hot issue, I mean, it, it, Syria is, is really boiling, and uh, unless the regime in Syria uh, effects real reforms, uh, genuine reforms, uh, the revolution will erupt and will spread across the region. So, uh, thank you. Please continue. Uh, I'm just going to vote because uh, this very important vote. Uh, Swad is chairing it, and we'll open for questions. And uh, you can ask questions to the uh, to the uh, panel. And uh, please try not to make speeches. Ask questions, and it will be better. Thank you very much. So could you please ask me a question? We can take a question at the time. Okay, that's the gentleman leading this. Yes. Could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, my name is Natasha Jane. I was wondering whether what is going on in, in, in uh, Libya now yes. is going to turn into another Iraq. So, could you answer that? Because you didn't manage to give me any answers. My name is Alex Yarrow, from the Federal Visa in the And uh, Libya will not turn uh, to the right, so we can stay on the same uh, issues. And uh, the Libyan people ask mainly for the help of the international community. And they uh, have made themselves clear to have. Not quite so. And uh, because uh, the uh, regime in Libya has committed uh, crimes and murder on the street of Tripoli and Gazi and Zali and Muslata, is in the country. We have victims of about 10,000 people so far, and uh, I think the time where the international community can take the decision to take further action to protect the civilian in Libya. Now, um, and I think, as far as, 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 far as the Libyan concern, that when the uh, regime is uh, stepped down, uh, there will be no more um, flights, there will be no more airstrikes, and that's the end of the matter. And I can assure you, this is clearly fine, that the Libya situation is not like the Afghanistan or not like Iraq. More than that is the Libyan ask for the help of the Turkish community and also have, uh, has supported by the Arab League their decision and has supported by many countries in the world. And that's basically, thank God that basically these nations is trying to help us to uh, save a lot of civilians on this, uh, on the Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, I've got a question to ask. When is it right to kill somebody or threaten to bomb them to get them to do what you want to do politically? Was it right for the IRA to bomb the Brighton Hotel to get freedom? Was it right for the Israelis to bomb the King David Hotel? Is it right for us to bomb Libya to get Gaddafi to do what we want him to do? And why is it our business anyway? If they kick off out here in the next route we have, will Bahrain and Saudi say the police shouldn't hit the students over their head, otherwise they'll have no fly zone for London? I'll tell you what late Peter Yusinov said. He said war is terrorism waged by the rich and the powerful, and terrorism is war waged by the poor and the powerless. It's the same side of the same coin. Same thing. Well, I think uh, the uh, people of Libya, or the people who started the uh, revolution in Libya, is the yeah, situation in Libya? Cannot compare Libya and Afghanistan? Or... Well, I cannot blame people for making comparisons, but we have to explain things. Because, uh, and, and, and listen to this, please. Because uh, a, a military intervention on the basis of the experiences of the past in Afghanistan and Iraq is not something that. Please, now we listen to you. You have to listen to him, please. Huh? Okay. You listen to the speaker, please. Okay. okay. We listen to your question. Yeah. Now you should listen to him. I'll tell you why they get lost as well. Anyway, carry on. Yeah, there are people who say this. Now let me tell you something. The Libyan experience uh, can, if the West wants, if NATO wants, can set a different standard. It can. It can if they want to prove to us that they intervened truly for humanitarian purposes. Once the Libyan people are free, and once they are able to re-establish their state and their state institutions, then they should be left alone. Yeah. If that doesn't happen, that's absurd. Please listen you know, to the speaker. Then well, that's an absurd thing to say. You can't interfere with someone to build their own democracy and their own politics, and then you just leave them alone and they'll sort themselves out. See, I, I know that's happening. Nothing, nothing, nothing that uh, yeah. anyone here will say will convince you, but if you give me just a minute. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, we two have to say something. You're actually now hogging the floor. You ask your question, can you please sit down so we can get a chance to ask our questions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. You see, I, I, I said earlier that the fact that the Libyan revolution has turned into a militarized revolution has frightened many people, even within the Arab world. Because that's not something people wish to see happen. But Gaddafi imposed it on them. He was slaughtering them. Now, the West initially hesitated when people were crying for help. Then they decided to intervene. Now, I cannot tell you I know what's in the mind, uh, on the mind or in the heart of uh, Obama or uh, uh, the leaders of Britain or any other country, but what I'm telling you at the moment is that this intervention has tilted the balance in favor of the revolutionaries. It has saved lives. It has saved lives. Okay? But what is really more important is whether this will be a different experience from what we saw in Afghanistan and Iraq. And that's, in, uh, uh, in my, to my mind, is another test for the world order that is led by the United States of America. Well, let's see what they say. All the lives are the Okay, we give you a chance now, Mr. Um, just want to make a point about uh, the, the gentleman over here asked for the, the, the revolutionaries in Libya not to be referred to as rebel, rebels. Uh, the same way, I just want to point out that the, the revolution in Bahrain has been smeared by the, the, the word of sectarianism. Because we were, I'm from a small channel that's been covering the event for about six weeks. We've been speaking to Sunni leaders and Sunni civil uh, society members who have been uh, at pains to say that this is an organic uh, revolution which is not sectarian, um, added to the fact that there have been a six-nation, an unprecedented six-nation invasion of Bahrain, there have been mercenaries who have been hired to uh, pick off the opposition members. Um, the problem is that, if we, again, because the narratives are so important when the way they're framed, uh, if we start claiming as Bahrain as this sectarian issue, I feel that it just obfuscates the the very legitimate uh, uh, uprising that the people of that country are engaging in. Right. Mm. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned, uh, and I used the word sectarian when I was um, when it was my turn to speak. Um, I take the point, but I, I mean, I have to say, um, in my defence and in, in defence of everything that has been re reported, it's um, you know, I mean, anyone feel free to disagree with me, but it is. Uh, 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 it is the Sun, uh, the Shia majority who are disaffected and uh, unhappy on lots of levels for many reasons against the Sunni minority who are the ruling establishment. So, I think in the in the case of Bahrain, there is uh, uh, it, it does differ slightly from what's happening in the rest of the middle uh, in, in the rest of the countries because. I think the uh, religious factor does actually play a part. I, th I don't think you can completely dismiss it. Mm. I don't think you can say that uh, the grievances that the people of Bahrain have are completely independent of their religious affiliation. And I think that the fact that it has been described as a war by proxy between Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia and Iran does uh, uh, add to that argument. I mean, obviously, Iran is Shia, Saudi Arabia is Sunni. Um, so... I mean, I, I don't know how else you would uh, specifically talk about the specifics in the Bahrain without referring to the Shia Sunni, Sunni division that you find within the region. I don't quite see how we would be able to approach it. I mean, fair enough. I mean, we can we can talk about the main reasons why the protests are taking place in the rest of the region, and I no doubt that those who are protesting in Bahrain have those same grievances, an end to corruption, better jobs, an end to poverty, more representation, more transparency. All those reasons apply to the Bahrainis, but I am inclined to think that uh, sectarianism does play some part. Would you, would you mind if I just have a gap here? Let me give you a chance to say right. right. that now. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Tamimi, I, I respect you very much, and I I met you many years ago, the first time, but I do think you're over-charitable ch about the Americans and the British. Can you really conceive, take the Second World War, the Germans marching into Russia, they do all these atrocities, and then they go down into Spain to liberate Spain. The Americans have proven themselves to be a totally barbaric, uncivilized race. They have behaved with, absolutely disgracefully in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, which is an ally of America, God help allies of America. Because you then get bombs, you get drones hitting you, you get continuous extrajudicial executions. And now they've spawned this new doctrine, the Davis Doctrine, whereby anybody from an American embassy <coughs> can go into the capital city streets, shoot someone down, kill them, and then be protected by the embassy and whisked away. Now how can you really believe, for one minute, that the Americans are going to be so liberal, so democratic, and allow the Libyans to choose their own government after this intervention. I don't think it's possible. The leopard does not change its spots. Well, I, I never said I... Uh, that was my position. I said this is going to be a test. Uh, now, in the Arab world, although people uh, discuss this a lot, especially in uh, closed meetings, uh, there is no um, overt opposition to the inter intervention of the Western powers as was the case in Iraq and Afghanistan for a clear reason that people could see that there was a humanitarian crisis here, similar to the one that was in the province at the time. So when, when people uh, are shocked by these images that keep coming to their uh, living rooms uh, of the persecution of the civilians, then they are left with Questions. I mean, what choices do the Libyan people have? That's what people started saying. Now, I, I personally, I would have preferred not to see that revolution become militarized. I would have preferred to see it continue the way it went ahead in Tunisia and Egypt, and the way it is in Yemen at the moment. That would have been the ideal thing. But that it, that, that it has become militarized, because this was imposed on it, and that Gaddafi could crush them and continue to punish the Libyan people the way he wished, that left us with a dilemma. Now, I'm not very happy about what's going on, but I don't think people have much choices. What I'm hoping for, and this is what I, probably where you misunderstood me, what I'm hoping is, is, that, is that for a change, probably this time the Western Alliance will pass the test 
of what they refer to occasionally as humanitarian intervention. Maybe I'll, I'll be proven wrong, I don't know. Okay, uh, the ladies who ask, and then the gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Um, my question is really to Dr. Atamemi. You, I think it's very dangerous to simplify the problem and say it's the same across the Arab region. And you said that you gave an example of Algeria and Morocco waiting to see what's happening in Libya before they react. I think these two examples are incredibly dif different. Algeria is one of the biggest gas um, producers in the world. It's got an iron fist type of uh, regime. Uh, it has just lifted state of emergency for the last three decades compared to Morocco that hasn't got any oil or any gas, yet reforms have been taking place. It has just introduced positive discrimination. It's got equal rights within the constitution for women. And I think for anybody to actually just simplify matters and say the whole Arab world is the same, the dominant effect, it's not true. Each country has got its own specific, as uh, Shanil said, each country has got its own political problems and challenges to face. And I think it's very, very important for those who don't know the Arab world to make those distinctions when they are um, speaking to an audience who perhaps is not fully aware of what is happening within the Arab world. Well, if you're, if you're suggesting that I don't know the Arab world... No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying to you that I happen to know exactly what... No, I do know you, Dr. Atamin. What I'm saying to you is the two countries are not waiting now, to see what's let's happening. Let's not misunderstand each other, because I think we agree. I think both of us agree, because what I, what I meant to say is that grievances are the same. There are the same grievances across the Arab region. Now, if that is something you are disagreeing with, that's up to you. Yeah, but I think throughout the Arab region, the Arab masses have felt throughout the, the past decades that they were totally excluded, marginalized, they had no say in their very own affairs, how their resources were dispensed with, and they felt humiliated. Now, the fact that in uh, Oman, uh, Sultan Tabus uh, did make some uh, reforms or offered some compromises, that cannot be denied. The fact that uh, King uh, Mohammed VII uh, did make some uh, overtures, that cannot be denied. The fact that the Algerians wanted to pull the rug from underneath uh, the opponents, that cannot be denied as well. So yes, there are differences, we can talk about these in detail, but what, we, what is really common uh, from Morocco to Bahrain to Kuwait or throughout the region, even in, in Iraq itself, is that there is a sense that this modern Arab state is a total failure. Okay, let's go to the gentleman. Yeah, okay. I just need to suggest to Suad, is it possible that the next event will be, will address the West, when they will change their tones and policies toward us, because we want them to deal with the people instead of dealing with the regimes. Just move on to the media faces, then we are going to... Yes, yes, yes. We need to save our people in life. Yes, I, I totally agree. Children, yeah. this, we, is, this, is, yeah, this is... After we celebrate the new... Yes, no, people, yeah, I mean, it's true. I, we have educated people, we have intelligence. We yeah. can then, we move to the next... You know why I said and that? Us to save Libya life. Yes, it's true. I agree with you, sister. This is why I said that, because the Westerns, Western countries, they know that regime since 1969. Okay, and then, then they've been dealing with... Who's helping Libya? Who's what we're waiting for? To all the Libyans? Yes, I agree with you. We should all of us. What we done for the Libyans? Yes, so I agree with you. So just we're talking big action and help Libyan people. Yes, I agree. I mean, as, as a person, I'm trying to myself. Libya is different. You cannot compare like Tunisia and Egypt and what he said in his speech. He's a clear house by house. He killed the women and children. Now yes. three weeks, I don't know my family is still alive or dead. Yeah, I agree with and you. And the people they ask me, how is that situation? Twenty people sitting in the street. I spoke to them. I yes, I then they moved, they said me sorry. As an example myself, I'm trying to, I'm an Algerian, I'm trying to tell my brother's Algerian, I know some, uh, some doctors, Instead, I mean, try to get some medicine for the, you know, everybody try to do, uh, you know, its own things and that. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. But at the same time, we hope that otherwise the they have to change that attitude and deal with the people instead of... Yes, we need, we need the West now to help yes. the people. Yes. Then we could take anyone from our world, Egyptian, Tunisia, anyone can help Libyan people. Yes. We have the people who can fight it, but we don't, there is no balance. If that he has a son, he's a missile, what would they have? The people like Abu Qasim. I think it would be finished soon. Can you imagine? Yes, because this is not in front of you. Yes, I agree with you. Sister. That's what happened in Libya. Yes, yes. But, sir, why should we help the people of Libya and not the people in Bahrain? Exactly. 
I have never seen human rights respected by any British government anywhere in the world. But we have no choice. Do you want to be waiting until all my family they will be killed? I Then to ask, okay, now I don't want to be in the field. What do you want me to put yourself in this situation? What I, I would say, say you have, is... You have nothing left in Libya. We should do something to protect Benghazi, I agree. But that does not involve a full-scale NATO operation to destroy the independence of Libya. You have it both ways. One time you're saying that you're against the war, and now you want to do something for Benghazi. I just would uh, like to explain one thing. It's not the same place. It's worse. It's the same as the one in the place now. They are worse than anyone. What you are saying, you know, lies on the display, the discussion that they took one country to another country. We are talking about Libya. Yeah, which maybe has no direct interest in it. Except for now the dictator of Libya is never seen any dictator in the world. Nice to get that. I saw I saw one in the okay, Hawaii. Hold a second. This is the problem we're saying to you. What are we talking about? We listen to each other. Otherwise we're going to have problems. Okay, what I'm saying to you, this this dictator, he is being killing people by Every side. But Bob McGarvey's been killing the Kashmiris. So you are, you are basically giving me examples all the time about Mugabe, about Bahrain, about other countries. It's fine. There's the whole world, there is so much problems. You cannot deal with the whole world in one minute. You need to deal with one at a time. So that's why we're going to move forward. So what I'm saying, if you finish the problem with Libya tomorrow, you're going to, okay, fine, you finish with the problem, you can deal with the rest of the human rights in the rest of the world. If you are talking about human rights, or you are talking about something else, which is basically human rights. Now, what I'm saying to you, it's basically Libya, the dictatorship has been, a criminal has been murdered. And he is, I will tell you, he just last night in Tripoli, in Zawiya, and it was like that, he was kidnapping people, a human being. They are fed to 200 people, has been taking them somewhere else. Do you know how many people they've been kidnapped until now? Thousands and thousands and thousands. The, he basically, he's, he's saying to the whole world, not only to the Libyan, Well, Kaysari, I'm going to get you, one by one. I'm going to run after you, house by house. And he terrorized people, he terrorized everybody. Okay, now what are we going to do here, as an international community? We're going to sit down and say, do nothing? No, he's basically, he is basically the kind of person who needs to be stopped somewhere where we don't have any problems around the world. He can okay. only not for the Libya, for the international community. To have a dictatorship and to speak with this language, it's too dangerous. I hope okay. I made my point. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. This is gentleman. Okay. Sorry to keep you waiting. So Thank you very much. And, uh, I was about to actually just mention that I come from Iraq. So I do know one of the things about sectarianism. And if I would make a comment for uh, Ms. Shalkri, when a people are 70% of one group and 30% of the other, and they go and demonstrate, statistically, a majority of those people are going to be from that big majority group. So to characterize what happens in Bahrain as being sectarian, as being unfair to Bahraini people. Absolutely. That's number one. Uh, number two, I would very much like to thank Dr. Malin and uh, uh, Dr. Tamimi for a very well thought out characterization of what is actually going on in the area. And uh, Dr. Malin has put her finger on some, a very important concept, which is this collective dignity issue. And that also applies to the Bahrainis, by the way. Because when you are ruled by an absolute monarch whose uncle has been prime minister for over 40 years, who overrules the king even, 
then you have something to object about. And that is the nature of the Bahraini issue. And then, in, to top it off, the Bahraini ruling family, the prime minister, over the head of the king, as it happens, if, I believe, if we believe the, the media, invites the Saudis, a foreign country, be, be they neighbors or not, because Russia was also a neighbor to Afghanistan, and when the Afghanistan government, legitimate Afghan government, a republic, by the way, invited the Soviet Union to, to, into Afghanistan to put down an armed rebellion, the whole West was up and on. Yeah. What happened in Bahrain is exactly a very similar issue. A, a neighboring country sent troops at the invitation of the ruling elite to put down, by the way, a, a, a peaceful protest. But we know we need about, about Tunisia, Egypt, and yes. Libya. Well, Egypt my, my point is, let us not be hypocritical about having one, one measure for, for Libya and a different measure for Bahrain. My, my question is to, to Tamimi, why is the West only interfering in Libya? Why don't we have a joint Arab force or a joint African force to interfere? It is better to see a joint Arab force or a joint African force instead of having the West interfering. Can, can, I, can I, Dr. Tamimi, would you mind if I answer that? Because, yes, yes, yes. Um, and, and the reason why I, I'll, I'll answer that is because as a member of House of Lords, when um, uh, the uh, Amir of Qatar was the uh, chairman of uh, uh, the o OIC, uh, he was the chairman of OIC, and I suggested to him uh, to have a Muslim OIC based peacekeeping force. Because, because of Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, uh, Sudan, lots of Muslim countries at that time you didn't have the problem. But you know, none of these rulers uh, were interested. Because actually, they never made any decisions. Because his answer was, have you talked to your own government in London? So like, if I wanted to talk to my government, well, let me tell you, I have just been informed that my uh, ballot question on Saudi Arabia has been accepted for Wednesday, and I will be asking questions on Saudi Arabia, on, uh, you can clap, I'll <laughs> <laughs> on, 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 on Wednesday. Well, I can ask these questions here, but the point is because these governments are illegitimate. The sheikhdoms and the kingdoms just didn't want to know because they didn't want to get involved. They just, you know, OIC is like a big dinner club. It's because the organization of Islamic conference is not even an organization of Islamic countries. It doesn't even have the basis. And when the Palestinians were being bombed and killed, they had an a, a, a OIC based conference in Malaysia. And I think uh, none of the Arab leaders attended that. Let me say a comment about this question, please. Uh, gentleman is from Libya. Yes, uh, my name is Abdelman. I'm Croatia. I'm from Tripoli, Libya, and I'm a British citizen as well. I just want to ha have some comments about what uh, I heard today. Uh, first of all, I wish that all the Muslim and Arab country interfered, and it will be very and fantastic that it is. Muslim, Muslim solution. This is beautiful solution, but in, in reality, it, it didn't work. Uh, I, I just want to ask a question. Uh, David Cameron, the Prime Minister here of uh, UK, if there is a like uprising in Manchester or Glasgow or Edinburgh, and people they want to change the government, and he used the airstrikes to bombard Glasgow, Manchester, and Edinburgh, do we accept that? No one will accept it. So this, the Gaddafi, in the first day of the 
peaceful intifada in 17 February, he came outside to the people and he speech to Libyan people. He said that I will kill all the opposition people who are against me. And uh, he will look after them street by street, house to house, room to room. So this man, he is a bloodshed. I just want to tell you a story that happened to myself when I was a child. Buses came to my, my, my school. It's a primary school. And they took us to the University of the Fatah, the, the university that I'm teaching physics in Tripoli. I'm a lecturer there in the 1990s, but I, I flee my country in 1998 because of the Gaddafi regime. So, a lot of students, a lot of ch uh, children, I found them in a big area at university. And what will happen there? A man in front of, of a thousand of students, the three people, they said, this is a traitor and he's a guest of the liberal revolutionists, and they hang this man up in front of all the children. This is a child abuse that happened to myself. Now, in the month of Ramadan, which is the holy month, fasting month, it's in the national Libyan TV, after we breakfast in the call of the Adan, when the sun sets, the national TV showed us horrible pictures, which is they brought another six men, and they said those are traitors because they are against of Gaddafi and the, the tear of Gaddafi, and they hung up those six youth men in front of all the Libyans. So it's a fear that we live in, un, under this regime. I just want to carry on. This man, he, he made, it's not, it's not the fear, it's, it's in the Libya, it's even outside, locally. Yusa in, 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 in Chad, French airplane, uh, the, the club in Germany. So this man, he will be a threat even to, if he stays in power, he will be a threat to all the international community and he will do a lot of a threat to British, to French, to European, to American. <coughs> so, I, I, myself, as a Libyan, and I'm from Tripoli, I'm very grateful to the international communities that interfere, they, are, they, they interfere late actually. I wish they, they, if they interfered three weeks ago. But we, we say thank God. If, if, they, if, if they haven't interfered, what will happen? We will have thousands of people who will be killed in Benghazi, in Shahat, in Beida, in Darna, in Tobruk. And he's a killer, he's a murderer. But it's more than 8,000 people has been murdered from Misrata, from Tripoli, from Zintan, from Zawiya, from Zawiya, from the West, Western part. So that, that, that we, we thank God that the American and the French and the, and the British people interfere uh, to stop this murder. Man, he, he's, and he also there to say something. Could you, could you accept from David Cameron, the Prime Minister, will tell you rats? How come in the world a leader calls his people rats and he called them dirty people? And he, he described his people with many so bad words. Do you accept that? Okay, I just want to carry on. I'm, I'm from Tripoli and there is a base, which is a military base, a navy <coughs> base, which is only half a kilometer from my home in Tripoli. And I just want to, take, to tell you about the precise attack. What, the, the, when, the bomb, when they bombed this base, it was only the military base. My house and my family house, my relative, they live only half a kilometer. Next day in the morning, they went and the attack is only in the military bases. There is no any civilian uh, uh, casualty. I just want to tell you, and for something which is, which is what, like Gaddafi, he used to take those bodies and <coughs> be killed by him. They put them in, in, in a different uh, attack base in the, in the military bases and also outside, and they said it's killed by the, the coalition forces. And another story, my, I have a relative which is leaders close to the hospital which is in, 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 in Tajura. After the, the first day of the, the, the bombing and the, it's finished, the Libyan, the, the Libyan, uh, which is the, the, the Libyan forces loyal to Gaddafi, they bombed the hospital by, by, by their tanks. Why? To tell the, to, to, to tell the international communities the, 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 the coalition forces is being bombed in the hospitals. Who stole the bomb? So it is, 
it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。はい。は
Um, and we know where, where, where that has led us in policy. Uh, Libya was, as someone pointed out earlier, the British government, European government, the U.S. governments have been selling arms, arming Gaddafi up to the teeth for the past uh, 10 years, in particular um, after September 11th and Gaddafi, um, uh, it, it, Gaddafi's uh, uh, incorporation into the war on terror. It's not an accident, in my mind, that he's been using the language of the war on terror to, uh, to, to violate the, the civil rights, uh, to kill his people and violate their civil political rights. This is, you know, the, the West wants us to pretend that we didn't hear that, that we're, you know, to look away. But actually, this is what these states in the region have been doing for the last 10 years, perhaps not to the extreme and not, I agree this is a pressing issue and, and this is something that we need to um, uh, be discussing. But the, the, the truth is, is that these regimes in the region have been killing their people, have been imprisoning their people, have been torturing their people in the name of the war on terror for the past 10 years. And this, these countries, this country, the UK, the US government and other European governments have been supporting it. And unless we have an analysis of that, we're not going to be able to avoid um, similar situations in the future. And that's, I mean, that, that, that's what, what I can see. Okay, any question? Okay, let's, uh, question. Please focus on the Don't go to Ilan. <laughs> no, I, I said he was in general because that is doing in India and totally with the Libyan people. And uh, I know the feeling that it's happening there because it's happening in Iraq. Uh, uh, I agree with the intervention. But in the same time, I would like to say one point that in the cities of Iraq, in Baghdad as well, there's in the recent weeks, there's lots of demonstrations against the government which the American put there. On the laws of the American, these demonstrations have been killed. And she not. And, yes. and just I would like to make note of that, if any of them comments on that. Uh, because there's, I think there's a black media Okay, now we close the meeting and thank you very much for all your attention to the speaker. Thank you.